All right. It's a pleasure being up here with you. The last time I was in Paris was actually a long time ago, and I got completely lost and ended up taking a train that was named Gleb. True, true story, but for another time. Today, let's talk about the cloud. Not the soft, white, fluffy APIs of the cloud, but what actually makes it run. Let's take a look behind the cloud. And to do that, let me start with a little bit of backstory. So in 2007, a friend of ours had a computer that crashed. She lost all her data. And she had no backup. And so we went and started thinking, if everybody doesn't back up their computer, they're going to lose everything eventually. So we went and started Backblaze with the idea of, let's just build a cloud backup service to help. And it was a very simple concept. We wanted to back up all the data so that people wouldn't have to worry about what to pick and choose. We wanted it to be completely unlimited, since most people don't know how much data they actually have. And we wanted it to be five bucks a month so that anyone could afford it. So a very simple concept. Back up all the data, five bucks a month, unlimited. The obvious question then was, where do we put that? And for us, what we thought originally was the obvious answer was, we'll put it on an Amazon S3. And that seemed good, except that for $5 a month, at the time, we could store 30 gigabytes of data. We figured most customers would store more than that, which means we'd lose money on every single customer. That's hard to make up in volume. So the next plan was, let's buy equipment. Let's buy servers from EMC or NetApp or Dell or somebody, and we'll write all the software on top of that. But what we found was that even though you could buy a one terabyte hard drive for about $100, a one terabyte hard drive inside of a storage server cost about $1,000. So that wasn't going to work either. We were a bootstrapped startup. We didn't raise venture. We had no money. That wasn't going to work. So we started thinking, I wonder if we could build this. And we talked to a variety of people, and they, and they said, you're nuts. First of all, there's no way you can compete on price with Amazon. They, they know how to run low-margin businesses. And there's no way you can build a better server than EMC or NetApp or Dell, because those are all you know, multi-billion dollar companies that do this. And those are both true statements. But it was figure something else out or go out of business, which you know, didn't seem like the best option. So we started down this path of, all we want to do is take a hard drive and plug it into the internet. And what's the least expensive way to do that? And so, like any good tinkers, we started just assembling parts and pieces of stuff and trying to see what would work together. We tried cascading USB hubs. OK, you guys were maybe smarter than we were. We thought that might work. The spec says you should be able to connect 256 devices. It doesn't actually work. Um, uh, we tried these DAS boxes, you know, direct attached storage little consumer boxes plugged into servers. And that kind of worked, but it was incredibly kludgy. I mean, you've got all these wires, and it was not dense, and it was really hard to manage. So, you know, we tried a variety of things, but we came up with this kind of four guiding philosophies of how to think about this that we followed. And let me talk through that a little bit. So the first one was toss the unnecessary. So when people said, you can't build a server that's better than what EMC or NetApp could do, I said, that's probably true. But we're not trying to build a better server. We're trying to build a better server for our use case, which is different. Our use case doesn't assume that one server is what you're going to run. Our use case assumes one server is going to be a part of a whole cloud. And so th what we wanted to do was keep the things that were important for us, which were it had to be very cost efficient, it had to be very dense, and it had to be power efficient. What we didn't care about was performance, availability, redundancy, all of those things we would do in software over a bunch of boxes. But if you were buying one server from EMC, you needed all those things. So step one, toss the unnecessary. Step two was use commodity parts. Generally speaking, anything that is made for the enterprise or made for the data center also means made to be expensive. 
And things that are made for commodity means that they are made in large volume with thin margins, and they're usually actually quite high quality because if you have thin margins and large volumes, you can't afford to take a bunch of parts back for warranty or do a lot of one-on-one -on -one support. So as much as possible, use commodity parts. And one example of this were the power supplies. You have a server power supply, you have a desktop power supply. They both convert AC to DC. They both follow the ATX spec. But one is shaped like a 1U pizza box that goes in a rack and is expensive, and the other one goes into a desktop server and is cheap. So since we have the ability to design whatever we want shape-wise, we use a desktop power supply. And you, you follow that through with every part that you can. So, <laughs> so we assembled some parts, a bunch of commodity components, and laid them out and tried to get them to work together. And then step three of the guiding philosophy was to prototype quickly. That is a true live plywood box server. It actually ran and we deployed it in a data center rack. <laughs> we might have had to close our eyes to the fact that it said, don't bring in flammable materials in the data center. <laughs> you know, details. Um, but we wanted to make sure that it fit in the data center rack, that, that it worked from a power perspective, worked from a, a heat perspective. And then the question was, well, we're not gonna make thousands of wooden box servers. So we needed to make it out of something. And we also didn't want to make thousands at first. We knew that one plywood box worked, but we needed to try and see a unit would work. So we found a prototyping company and had them build us a steel case. One, not a thousand, so that we could prototype. And for just a thousand dollars, they cut us a steel case. And amazingly, we were actually really surprised by this, when we put all the components in, everything actually fit. So we had our steel case, and from that, we had our fourth guiding philosophy, which was to use Agile for hardware. We all think of, oh yeah, sure, we use Agile for software development, but you can use it for hardware as well, because the first version isn't necessarily going to be perfect and the thing you want to use forever. So we actually do these four-week sprints where we set up the backlog originally, we prioritize, and then we have a hard deadline, four weeks, and we iterate through as many of those things as we can, get to the end of it, do another sprint. And part of it is trying to get as many things done in that four weeks as possible. And some of the types of things that we do with that are we found a shop that can bend metal in one week instead of two. We found 3D printing would help us um, make some of the components that go inside of here. We wouldn't use 3D printing at scale, but it's great for uh, the agile process of spinning through these things quickly. So with all that, we have what we call a backblaze storage pod. It's a very dense, cost-efficient server for storing data. How cost-efficient? This is a chart we published when we originally um, talked about this design. So the little tiny number, the green thing at the top, is just the cost of raw hard drives. A petabyte worth of hard drives at that point would have cost you 80 grand. If you actually deployed them in Backboy storage pods, including the drives, that's the slightly bigger red number there for 117K. And then you can see all the other numbers, whether EMC, NetApp, or Dell, that are, you know, 10 times the price. So you can see how this would save tremendous amount of money by, at, at cloud scale. Amazon S3 is up there. It's a little apples and oranges. Uh, it's a service, not, not storage. Um, but we were trying to do some analysis originally about if we take out the price of electricity, of colo costs, of management, you know, roughly what it would run. So very, very cost efficient way of storing data. Now, we did do the backup service and we offered the, the unlimited backup service and people kept asking us, um, developers kept asking us, look, what I, I, you know, I like your backup service, but what I need is direct access through an API to your actual raw cloud storage. And so we introduced a service that does that, ironically competing with Amazon for a quarter of their cost. To do that, we've actually needed to continue to iterate on this storage hardware design. And 
what you're going to see here is actually in a second is something that you're getting a, a one hour spoiler preview um, that we're going to announce in an hour. So don't tweet about this yet, please. But we've, we're now doing storage pod version 6.0. It's the biggest, most dense, fastest storage pod that we've ever built. It's 60 hard drives, 10 gigabit uh, connection, 480 terabytes stored in one box. And the entire server costs eh, about four grand to build, which is, you know, high-end consumer NAS box. Um, so very, very, very cost efficient. So the storage pod, like I said, is one component of this. And, like, and the goal is to look at how does this all fit into a cloud environment. So you, you have to think of the storage pod as it's meant to go down. It's meant to break. Drives are meant to die. These are all just components. The next layer up from the storage pod is a vault. And a vault is 20 storage pods as one logical unit deployed in 20 different racks. When a file comes in, we chop it up into 20 pieces, send one piece to every storage pod in every rack, and then we can recompile from any 17 of those pieces when you ask for a file back. That's the vault level. The next level up from the vault is then the actual cloud storage environment, which includes the file system that handles understanding where on all of these vaults are all the files and how to load, balance, and distribute and do all of those kinds of things. So we now have about 200 petabytes. We add about 10, 10 petabytes a month or so um, to this environment, all in these low-cost components. OK. so. This seems like it was all unicorns and roses uh, at, in getting to this. Everything was seamless and not a problem. And that might have been a little bit fiction. So um, let me share with some of the challenges that we ran into. OK, remember when I said everything fit? Everything fit, but we forgot one little thing, which was a hole for the power button. So th this is our VP of engineering doing some very delicate engineering work with pliers breaking a hole for the power button. Um, er early on, we also found that, for some reason, some of the drives were unstable. They would pop out of RAID arrays too frequently. And we thought that maybe power was the issue. So this is our CTO cutting holes in the bottom of the storage pod so that we could make a Swiss cheese pod where the cables underneath are each connected to an individual power supply so we could power all the backplanes separately. Turned out it wasn't power. We thought maybe it was cooling. So we tried cooling the components, and then we tried sticking just a big box fan on top of the storage pods and trying to see if that would actually uh, help. Turned out drives were plenty cool. They were cold. They wanted a parka. Um, that wasn't the issue. It turned out that vibration was the issue, but only for certain drives. So we had one particular drive model that we happened to have a lot of that happened to be very sensitive to vibration. Took a little time to figure that out. Um, other issues. At one point, we did a sprint. We did one of these versions of the storage pod. We shoved it into the rack. And you could just see as the paint peeled off the top. Because it was just a couple microns too thick for a 4U rack. And we had to do another sprint where we just shaved a millimeter off of the height of the rack. Then the lattice structure that held the drives in place we didn't account for um, this thing called um, humans. And humans have fingers, and they're not great at grabbing the very tippy top of the hard drives. So we actually have to sh uh, relocate the lattice structure down a little bit lower. The other thing with the lattice structure is we just put it on the very top. Well, when you shove the drive down, you need to have it land on the connector. And it was kind of hard to get that wiggle right. So we ended up having to get another layer um, with drive guides down there. Um, then there was flooding in Thailand. Why would we care about a flood in Thailand being a company in California? Well, it turns out that half of the world's hard drives were made in Thailand. And when there was a flood, you could not buy internal drives, or at best case scenario, they were two or three times the price. So um, we started doing what we called drive farming. We put a map up of the entire area around the office and marked where every store was that sold drives and where every employee lived and said, congratulations, as part of your job here is to stop by the nearest store on your way into the office and get as many drives as you can. 
And the thing was, it wasn't the internal drives, because those were unavailable. It was the external drives that you would buy as a consumer and plug into your USB. So those drives, we then had to do what we called shucking. Shucking is a very delicate process of cracking open hard drive cases to get the raw hard drive out of it so that you can put it into a server. We were going through about 1,000 hard drives a month. There was a lot of driving and shucking going on for several months while uh, we were trying to get drives. Um, and then, you know, there were other issues. Okay, technically kids were inside of servers was not real, a real issue we had. Okay, so if you are building hardware, whether for the cloud or, or some other large-ish scale environment, these four guiding principles generally apply, which is just because it's done one way doesn't mean you have to, so toss the unnecessary. If you can, use commodity parts because anything made for the data center is probably overpriced. Prototype quickly, plywood or whatever method you choose, and then still plan on doing agile sprints even though it's hardware. Don't, don't think of it as it's hardware, so it's gotta be perfect out the gate. If you want to use the storage pods, we have actually open sourced the entire design. If you go to backboys.com slash storage dash pod, there are links to the CAD drawings, the wiring diagrams, the parts lists. You can download it, you can use it, you can modify it, you can do whatever you want with it, and, and many people have. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed that piece. <laughs>